Welcome everyone. My name is Sierra Ladroma. I am the project manager for the Iowa Center's Women's Business Center. The Iowa Center's Women's Business Center is funded in part through a cooperative agreement with the U.S. Small Business Administration. After this event, all of you will receive an email with a form to complete. This information allows us to continue providing free educational programming for small business owners in Iowa. Throughout the webinar, feel free to use the chat or Q&A box to join the conversation. Today, we are joined by David Tracy. David is the founder and CEO of Northgate Marketing. David has traveled to more than 40 countries in the course of working in international nonprofits. He and his family put down roots in Des Moines in 2019, bringing his international vision and desire to put hands and feet on his conviction that one of the best ways to promote positive change in our world is through media, arts, and marketing. We have a featured guest with us today as well, a team member of Northgate Marketing, Philip Lynn. David and Philip, thank you so much for joining us today and spending your time with us. The screen is yours. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I think uh, we 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 all agree that we would love to be at the beach that's in the backdrop here right now, <laughs> with the weather the way it's been. Um, I'm a little bit envious of Philip. Um, he actually lives in Hawaii, uh, originally from Taiwan, but lives in Hawaii currently in California, but going back to Hawaii I think tomorrow, right? So correct. This is actually the view from my balcony. Well. Uh, drone shot a little higher, but you know, when I look out, this is where I live. So don't be too jealous. <laughs> yeah, well, too late. Um, well, really it is a, a my pleasure to be able to join you all today. Um, I gotta say that um, this topic is one that I'm personally very passionate about, but at the same time, um, I, 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 walk, I walk it with a lot of um, caution and care. Because one of the things I'm going to talk about is whenever we talk about uh, being about cultural diversity, um, we need to be very careful to never assume anything. And one of the best things we can do is to ask questions from people who are actually from that culture. Um, just a little bit of, about myself uh, and why this topic uh, was one I was invited to talk about. Um, like Sierra said, I have traveled to over 40 countries, I actually grew up abroad. Um, I lived in Panama from the age of seven, so a total of uh, 25 years in Latin America. Um, also lived in Mexico, Guatemala. Um, I'm fully bilingual. Um, I grew up in a very, very uh, diverse community um, where a lot of my very closest friends were indigenous uh, from indigenous tribes of Panama. Um, and some of my other closest friends were from uh, China because 14% of the population is Chinese in Panama. Um, and of course, uh, I, I consider myself, uh, you know, I'm Caucasian or white from the outside, but my heart is very, very much, much a, a melting pot of, of culture. Um, uh, so I, I love talking about this. Um, we have a lot to cover. Um, Philip, I don't know if you'd like to introduce yourself. Philip is our Chief Business Development Officer in Northgate Marketing, um, and you can share a little bit about yourself. Well, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Philip Lin, and you can see in my little ID, that's my Chinese name, Ling Song Ya. But, you know, if you can pronounce it, great. If you can't, just know me as Philip. I grew up in Taiwan. Um, if you don't know where Taiwan is, we invented boba tea. So <laughs> you're, you're very welcome. And um, it's also w very well known for high tech manufacturing. So if you have an uh, Apple ID, uh, Apple product, probably a lot of it comes from Taiwan and um, computers and all the other things. So anyway, um, grew up in Taiwan, lived in the States from five to eight in Houston, Texas, where I learned my English. And then I moved back to Taiwan and grew up in the public system. So didn't go to international school, but just really got back and rooted in the whole Mandarin Chinese culture. And then when I was 23, that's when I went to Hawaii to do a training school. And then from there, stayed there. Married my wife, who's from China. We met in Hawaii. And then she's an amazing photographer. And we both work with Northgate. And then that's kind of our, um, that's how I got into the media side. But really being, going from Taiwan to Hawaii and Hawaii being such a melting pot of, of culture, that that's where my heart is because I, I changed so much and matured in my personal opinion because I experienced the clash of culture and there's so much value and treasure in it. And that's why 
I think we're here today and to really discover that and embrace it. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of my background. I travel to 30 countries now, um, continue to try to catch up with David, hopefully soon. But um, yeah, and I have a daughter that's four and a half. And she's been to 13 countries. So that's kind of our whole household is we go and we go together. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to be with you today. Absolutely. All right. So I'm, I'm going to be sharing my screen with you guys now as we go into the topic. And Philip will be pitching in here and there. Um, as always, uh, with any of the workshops with the Iowa Center, if you have questions, just please submit them. We'd love to hear from you. So um, all right. So can everybody see that? OK, cool. So our topic is culturally aware holiday marketing. Um, and right now, I mean, this year, I think everybody's talking about culture, diversity, inclusion. Um, and it's a really, really hot topic. But I'm wanting to make it more human. I think that when it comes down to it, we can look at people as either statistics or we can look at them as human beings with value. And we want to recognize the, the, the individuals within our communities and honor them and respect them and include them. Um, and so this is my family. I have four uh, beautiful daughters and a beautiful wife. Uh, my daughters have traveled with me extensively. Um, they, we also lived a brief stint in Hawaii where they were able to perform hula and train in hula. Uh, and it was absolutely amazing. Um, we moved to Iowa to um, just to be closer to family, um, and we started the marketing agency here in Des Moines um, earlier this year, February. Um, and of course, the pandemic hit, which was a whole <laughs> another story. But Northgate Marketing is a group of a diverse group of people who've come together to form this agency. Um, this isn't even all of us. There's about 23 of us all together. Um, I couldn't fit everybody on the screen, so sorry, everyone. Uh, who is watching this later and was not included. Um, but uh, we have people from Indonesia, from China, from Taiwan, from Mexico, from uh, uh, the Netherlands, from Panama, uh, from uh, many other countries, Egypt and our team. And it is really amazing as a marketing agency, as we work together collectively for our clients to get the different perspect cultural perspectives from the team as a whole towards the, any given project because everybody adds and brings something to the table that contributes to the project as a whole, which gives us really a unique package at the end of the day. It's not just one perspective, but there's a diversity of perspectives coming together, collaborating for the same project, which is a really beautiful thing. And I just love it. I love my team. I love what they each person brings, their experience, their expertise, but also their diverse backgrounds. Um, and so um, I keep moving here. I just wanted to go over a couple stats, and we're not going to be able to go through every single one of the specific minority groups in Iowa, but I just wanted to kind of give perspective. So first of all, um, this is a this is from the Iowa Data Center. It was a, the 2020 stats, which some of them are still in the 2018, 2019 bracket, but um, we have approximately um, as of July one. 2019, there were 198,550 Latinos in Iowa, um, which is the largest uh, minority group we have in Iowa. That's 6.3% of the state's total population. And, um, and so, and that's really across the board in the US. There are some states that have a lot more than this, but that's a pretty high percent percentage. And as we consider marketing in our communities, we definitely need to be considering the Latino community with uh, within our within our surrounding areas. Um, they represent such a big part of who we are within our communities now. Um, this is a huge increase. So for example, from 2000 to 2019, there was 140.7% change in the population, uh, over 116,000 people moved, to, um, Latinos moved to Iowa between the year 2000 or in, in two, 2019 or um, have grown their families. And so it's amazing uh, to see this kind of growth. The projected growth that is expected by the year 2050 is that we'll have over 407,000 Latinos within our communities. And so in Iowa, 
um, the biggest percentage of Hispanics are Mexican, um, but we also have uh, Hispanics from Guatemala, El Salvador, Puerto Rico, Honduras, Colombia, Spain, and many others. And so I don't know about you, but I just love the opportunity I get to go to some of the amazing Ecuadorian, Peruvian, or Mexican restaurants here in Des Moines. There's just amazing food. Actually, Philip was here a couple weeks ago. And it, it's just a, a really a, a pleasure <laughs> that we get to have real authentic um, Latin American food here. Um, you know, growing up in Latin America, uh, it was one of those things when I moved to the States and I would go to a certain friend and be like, we're gonna have Mexican food. It was like Tex-Mex. Like, it's not quite the same thing. Um, and so, yeah, I just love that. Um, Asian Pacific Americans in Iowa, um, and according to a 2018, uh, basically they, there is approximately 2.7% of the population is Asian, that's 87,000. I think it's actually a little bit more now. Um, but that's, uh, there was an increase of 134% between the year 2000 and 2018. That was a 49,000 numeric increase. And they project that there will be around 195,000 Asians, uh, uh, Iowa residents. Uh, by the by, the year 2050. That's uh, we need to be looking ahead. You know that there's a growing numbers. Um, uh, I'll just throw in Hawaii because I both Philip and I have lived in Hawaii. So uh, I did, I was really surprised by this number. Um, the total number of Iowa residents who say they are Hawaiian or from another Pacific island is 4,232. I did not realize that there are this many um, Hawaiian Pacific Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders in Iowa. So that's really cool. Um, so here we see the different breakdown. So 16.3% Chinese, 15.5% uh, uh, Asian Indian, 14.6% Vietnamese. Um, I think we can see this reflected in a lot of the grocery stores here in Des Moines for, as an example, as we go. And I love going to the different markets and seeing like the Southeast Asian products. Um, a couple weeks ago, I made a big Panamanian arroz con pollo. Um, and I was able to get banana leaves in Des Moines at one of the Asian markets, um, which was just absolutely incredible. And so I'm personally really thrilled with how much diversity we have here in Des Moines. Um, now, as we go into the, this topic of culturally aware holiday marketing, there's a lot of reasons why. Now, first of all, we know that as we do marketing, our whole goal is obviously to increase awareness of our brand, our product, our services, and to get more clients. And it is a disservice to us if we don't understand who is within our community. You know, we really need to understand, you know, what neighborhoods are around us, what minority groups we have in, within our communities, because they're also either currently a client or they could be a client, depending on how you market. And so it's very strategic, but I don't like this topic, talking about it from a strategic standpoint. We all know that marketing is about increasing <laughs> your sales at the end of the day, increasing your revenue through more sales. And, um, but I wanna make it more human. So I'm also a certified chef, okay? And so one of the things I told Sierra was that it's interesting from a marketing standpoint, my perspective is not just marketing, but I look at it from the hospitality industry standpoint. Um, so I was, I've been in uh, the food industry for many, many years um, and I actually, uh, went to culinary school years ago and was able to finish it through thick and thin, lots of logistics and, and juggling uh, life, you know, four kids moving. Um, and I was able to graduate with, with my uh, culinary certification as a chef this year in June, which was really exciting. Um, but when I consider um, the different times in my life where I've made dinners, catered dinners for a couple hundred people um, internationally or, or um, fine dining uh, buffets and different things, I try to make sure that I, I study who's coming to the event because I want to make sure that there's, some, there's something in my buffet or in my dish that's going to satisfy every palate. And so in different events that I've had, we've had events where we've had people from Southeast Asia coming or from India. Uh, we've had uh, dinner parties where we've, we, we had, um, you know, a large Latino uh, uh, lots of Latino countries coming and visiting as well. And I wanna make sure that the food represented them 
and celebrated them, but it was also something that they would enjoy to eat. So what we catered something that made everybody have something that they would enjoy while working together as a whole. And there's something very, really special about that where we are um, very, very um, inclusive. So as an example, most restaurants nowadays have gluten-free options in their menu. And that's because there is a growing number of people through who realized that they had gluten intolerances. And to accommodate that need or to accommodate that niche, both strategically, of course, to increase sales, but also to grow the number of people who would be coming into their business, most restaurants now offer a gluten-free option. It's strategic. It makes sense. But we're also valuing those individuals who would come who have special needs within their diets. And so from a, from a marketing perspective, we need to have the same mindset as we do in the hospitality industry, which is how can we facilitate our product and our service so that everybody who's in our community would want to partake or, or, or purchase or call us for whatever the service is. Um, this comes across in various ways that we communicate. It's not only verbal, it's not only, sometimes it can be very subtle. For example, this is one of our clients here in Iowa. It's a local uh, holistic um, wellness center, or it's a clinic, a health clinic called Integrative Family Medicine that's opening up next week, actually. Um, and as you can see here, this is their brochure. Um, it actually folds in three. Um, we could have picked a variety of different photos for this, but one of the, the statements that right away we made was we're not gonna just put, even though we know that a large percentage of the community here in Des Moines is uh, Caucasian or white, we decided to put someone who was of color in the, in the picture in order to celebrate and to say, you're, wel you're welcome. We're not going to, uh, we wanna make it um, warm and welcoming for everybody and showcase diversity right off the bat. And so it's subtle, but it makes, a, it makes a statement right away. We see it here with various photos. You know, I, I think this was, you know, uh, basically we try to, in most of our marketing, to have various components to represent the communities around us and not to limit just because certain stock photos we chose primarily are white or because we tend to think more within the perspective of our own culture. Um, now I'm gonna go into how, why and how you go about doing this in a little bit, but there's so many ways to be inclusive in your marketing on whether that be social media, video production, your website, the images that you choose, your brochures, your, your verbiage, the whole nine. Um, and it takes a process. And what we tell people is um, to never assume anything. <laughs> and I'm gonna go into that in a little bit and how we ask the right questions to the right people, right? Um, so basically, um, as we approach this Christmas season, um, of course we have November as well as many holidays. I'm just gonna highlight Christmas. In addition to the Christmas season, we also have Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Bodhi Day, Pancha Ganapati, Los, Las Posadas, St. Lucia Day, Boxing Day, Omisoka. Some of these are things that you might have heard of, uh, events or holidays that you might have heard of, and some of them might be new to you. These are, most of them are actual holidays that people within Iowa actually are celebrating within your communities. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each of these uh, specific holidays to explain how they are because I'm not an authority <laughs> on exactly what happens. But what I recommend that people do is that if is that you research your community, you research your market, you research your geographic zones and your neighborhoods around your business or in your radius, because some a lot of small businesses are more focused locally. Some businesses are focused more statewide and others are nationwide. And the approaches and how you market is gonna be different for every one of them. So one of the examples that I give, um, like I said before, is to is never assume anything. But one of the examples that I give is that when, if you live in a small rural farming community in Iowa and there are really, there's not a lot of cultural diversity, it may not make sense for you to do advertising that's holiday inclusive about, about um, you know, uh, Kwanzaa as an example because your, your market is local. But if you're in Des Moines, that's a whole different story. Des Moines has a ton of different diverse minority groups. And so it is strategic and relevant for you 
to be um, advertising culturally um, relevant um, content on your social media feed and then any other advertising that you do, um, particularly on the days of those holiday events that are happening as well. Um, so never assume anything. One, one of the things I, I talk to people, it, tell people is go ask questions to the right people. If you don't know, don't assume that you know and don't necessarily take Google, a Google search as the, the end all could potentially approach people within your community who are from that culture and ask them questions about how they would celebrate um, and what, what they would like to see on your advertising. It may take some time, but you're more guaranteed to get it right. We've had a couple instances in the past um, where we did some advertising and we assumed that we knew and we pushed it out some advertising and it, it was very, very divisive when we were trying to be inclusive and ended up being divisive, we had to withdraw the content and completely change it be because we had not consulted with one of the minority groups within the Des Moines, our Des Moines community. And so basically this was on behalf of another client, not directly our Northgate marketing, but we eventually asked this, um, this uh, person from the, the community to please share with us what we had gotten wrong and what we needed to remedy going forward. And um, we totally respected what they, what they had to say. And we made sure to, to, not, um, to not communicate what we had communicated in a way that um, was dishonoring. And so it's, it, there is a lot of sensitivity that needs to be, and, uh, and sensibility that needs to be had during these processes. David, can I ask, add yeah. something to that? Um, so as a Taiwanese American, so, and especially back in like when I was five, so that was 20, 31 years ago, well, 30 years ago when I was living in the States. So back then um, there was a trend, especially in Asia, when we moved to the States, there was this sense of the America is great. Um, sorry, not trying to push for one of the presidential candidates right now. Not, that was not my intention. Um, but there's a better than mentality as a Taiwanese that, that came to the States from our parents and um, all these immigrants, right? These minorities are mostly immigrants, probably second generation, maybe the third, but probably the mo most of them that you're facing right now is the first generation or the second generation. So when they come, they naturally feel there's an inferior thing inside of them. So there's a better than, and then there's a lesser than. And then a minority already feel, I'm here because American culture or society, or at least there's a freedom there that's better that helps you make money. So when you don't ask questions and just assume, you trigger them that kind of inferiority and make them feel bad and say, you're only using this to get money, to get clients or to make money off of me, but you actually don't care. And then I'm gonna be like, after traveling around the world for so long, what I'm really feeling or my personal observation could be off, but this is kind of what I'm seeing. Um, in the African culture, Latino culture, Asian culture, we're way more um, team, community, people oriented compared to the Western culture, American, European culture be task oriented. So when you do something that's task oriented to these um, Asian Latino culture, they feel it right away and, and say, you're not doing it genuinely. You're just doing it to make money off of me. Give you a horrible recent example. And I might step on toes because you maybe really like it. The new Mulan that came out. <laughs> um, the first scene, if you watched it, Mulan lived in a round house. And then as the Taiwanese, well, the round house actually is a very unique architecture that is in my wife's province, which is in Southern Southeast China. The Mulan story all took place in Northern Central China. And then immediately when we saw that scene, because Mulan is like advertised and pushed as 
very cultural aware. Like we asked the Chinese to understand and they're, Disney is banking on it to really open the door for China. But unfortunately, it didn't happen. And then, of course, later we realized the story, the script writer, the director, everybody was Caucasian. Not saying being Caucasian is wrong, but it's a perfect example of just assuming and thinking it looks cool. So you just did it. But now Mulan is not very popular in China, Taiwan. And of course, there's another reason to that. But in Taiwan, it's not very popular. We all laughed. My wife and I watched it and we just laughed. We were like, let's just not be offended from the Chinese culture perspective because they basically got probably 95% of the cultural elements wrong. But then that turns us off, right? And then it's really not a big deal in China anymore. They were hoping for it to be. So I think just really emphasizing what David is saying, don't assume you know, but really find someone to ask and hear from them. And then when you value them, it will show in your display, in your products, and then they can really feel it. Instead of thinking, you know, oh, I'm doing it because I need to, because there's a target audience out there. But as the minority or the less, the more diverse people, we can feel it. Um, and that's the last thing you want. You don't want them to feel being used or being just like, oh, being seen as a dollar sign. Um, and then that turns them off and turns them away from you. So yeah, that's my little two cents there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's there. It's interesting, you know, how much criticism the Mulan movie has gotten actually. And um, the way I describe it is it's like trying to set the little house on the prairie in Phoenix, Arizona in the middle of the desert. It just doesn't add up. <laughs> It's like, you know, we we need to. Be, they could have been much more culturally aware, and they weren't. Um, so ask questions. We have so many great resources within our community. The Iowa Center is one, um, and Culture All is another. There's um there are several other entities here in Iowa you could reach out to, but essentially, um, just ask the right questions and to the right people. Okay, and sometimes we don't even know what. The right question is and that's where we can talk to the people and see what would you like to see you know what would you what would be relevant for you within marketing uh, of my product or my brand um one other thing too people are not checklists you know i think that's one of the things that we've seen oftentimes uh is that we need to fulfill a certain quota and that's not the whole goal here we're not looking to do okay I have an African American or black representation on my site. I have Latino, I have Asian. It's not a checklist. It's really comes down to your core values. And if we can, if you can have your core values reshaped or formed, it can help you to transmit and to communicate with integrity in a way that is legitimate and honest. And I think that one of the things that Philip was alluding to is people don't like to feel like a statistic or a number. And people need to know that they're valued as individuals. And that needs to be something that comes from the heart and is genuine. And it is easily transmitted. When our values are off, it's really easy for them to be transmitted through our advertising and our marketing and have it be off as well. Um, we recently had this within internally within Northgate. Um, we are currently in a process of rebranding Northgate and actually redoing our website and redoing a lot of things actually. Um, why? Because a lot of people within my team, and they're completely right, said, David, Northgate has grown and changed. We are very multicultural and diverse, and that's not represented near enough <laughs> and within, our, within your, our branding. And it was true. When Northgate started, it was myself. And, you know, as most businesses start, it's just, you know, one or two people and you do something and you get going. And as we grew and we started to get clients in Asia and clients in Latin America and um, throughout the US and our, and our team began to, to, was much more diverse, we realized that we were still expressing ourselves in a way that was not actually relevant to number one, our market, and number two, who we actually are. Um, and so we're actually in the process of changing that. And that comes down to the colors we choose. Um, we're actually looking at having different um, colors for the different regions of the world. So like an Asia aesthetic for Asia and an African aesthetic for Africa. And because our agency is looking to become uh, to have locations worldwide as we grow. 
Um, and so we're preparing for that growth as we go, as we look ahead over the next five, 10 years, we're preparing for that even now through our branding. Um, and so um, what was nice about this was that our team felt like they were able to contribute in our image instead of it just being top-down leadership where we just said, this is, what, this is what we are. By including them in that process, each individual within our team felt valued and felt heard. And we were able to create something that was much more beautiful as a, as a whole. Um, all people and all cultures are unique and have incredible value. You know, there's so much, so much that I have learned over the years by traveling and learning from people who are different than me. And when I take the time to understand them, and I've been invited to different holiday events in their homes, and we've been able to, uh, even, even similar, similar um, celebrations that happen within the same holiday. Just, just take Christmas as an example. How many different ways is Christmas celebrated depending on what culture you come from? Now, not all cultures celebrate, uh, or uh, different groups celebrate uh, Christmas, but even there's differences within Latin America, like the difference of how what, what is done and how it's celebrated and the food that's eaten will vary from place to place. Um, you know, in, in the States, you know, it's very, uh, Christmas ham is always kind of a, a big thing, whereas uh, in other countries, that's not really the thing. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I love learning. And I think what, what we're trying to enforce here is a hunger and a thirst for learning and, ask, and, and getting to know the people within your community. We can always learn something new. Um, and I, um, I think there's a lot of humility that needs to be in place here. Um, I think that as Philip was saying, as, as American, as a US culture, and especially I would say me as a, a, a white American Caucasian, it can be very, very easy for me to have an individualistic mindset that thinks I, that I can pave my own path and make it and understand how things are. But the reality is that um, the times I've grown the most was when I was stretched and when I was able to learn something uh, through and realize that, you know what, there is a different way to do things. Um, one of the examples I give was in Panama, uh, we had different projects that needed to be done and we would have different volunteers come to do either medical care or do um, build homes for people who didn't have homes or um, you know, build wells for people who didn't have running water. And we would get a bunch of different volunteers uh, coming from around the world to help in a common project. And you can <laughs> imagine how interesting it was to have, see the different perspectives and how you tackle the same thing. And what was interesting was each one of them would of our people, whether they were from an indigenous tribe in Panama or from Asia or from the States or Latino, the project got done in each of the sites. It was finished by the due date, but how they did it was a little different. Some, in, and some of them were much more task oriented with checklists. Others were more relational oriented as they went along. Uh, it, it just was different, but I loved seeing how in the end, at the end of the day, each of the locations, the homes would be built but how they went about doing it and what they prioritized first was completely different. There's sometimes really, truly, honestly, not a wrong way. <laughs> there can just be a different way. And so, um, so this is another thing I wanna bring up and it's tolerance versus celebration. You know, one of the things that is oftentimes spoken about today in today's society is the word tolerance. And though that's important, I don't like that word a lot because it, it tends to say, I tolerate you. <laughs> I don't wanna tell, I, that sounds kind of harsh. You know, I'd rather celebrate people. So let's celebrate, not, like, not just tolerate, let's find the unique qualities that's in each individual and in each community and each culture. And let's, let's celebrate their uniqueness, their individuality, their diversity, and let's see what we can learn and what we can bring together uh, and so um, I would say let's up the ante in how we present. And so, um, and like I said before, research your target market, understand your community, ask the right questions to the right people, and essentially um, get to know who your clients are and who your clients could be, depending on how you market. Um, and so I, um, 
wanted to just see if there was any questions as we go forward. I don't know if that's even possible in the way this is formatted, Sierra, if you could let me know. Um, I think Sierra had something she needed to go handle real quick, but there's a Q and A oh, section. A so go ahead and place your things. If you have any questions so if there. If you have any questions, you can feel free to, um, to, to um, put them in the message area. So yeah, as you guys do, I think I would like to elaborate a little more, give a little more specifics on what it means to feel to um, on, on the side of being tolerated or on the side of celebration and just giving some practical examples what, of what that really looks like, right? We a lot of the times here, oh, I have to do this. I have to do these things because it's required of me. It's a task. Coming back to the task and relationship kind of perspective approach. So when you tolerate something, you actually don't like it, right? You don't like it, but you have to do it. So because you have to do it, you move forward, but you're like grinding your teeth and your heart's not embracing it, right? Um, but I just have to. I have to wipe my daughter's, um, change her diaper because it's, I, I have to do it. I don't think no, anyone's going to celebrate that unless she had like constipation for four days and you're like, yeah, she's pooping. But it's like, oh, I have to do this. So fine, I'll do it. But what does it mean to really celebrate is you genuinely enjoy what they enjoy. You genuinely enjoy what they enjoy. Because when you don't, when you, when you are able to embrace what they care about and then celebrate it, then that means that you value the things that they value. You won't celebrate anything that you don't value, right? You're not gonna spend time on your guests because you don't care about them. If you don't value the guest that comes in, we all do, um, we're all running a business, so we understand. So we will value our clients and have snacks for them, um, dress up for them, and then spend the right time because we value them. So we celebrate them. But if you're only like, it's a um, coworker that you don't like to talk to, and when you meet with the person, you're never, you're not gonna like spend the time to buy coffee and prepare nice pastries when you have to meet with the person. So when you're actually celebrating, you're caring about the things that they care about. And from the place of you truly caring, you will celebrate. So another um, exact same concept, but just another wording for those that might, uh, might help is instead of endearing people, embrace them. Mm -hmm. Instead of endearing the culture, oh, it's around me, so I have to just figure it out and then just suck it up um, because it's there embrace it, make it a part of you, ask the questions, sit down with the person that's from a different culture and get to know them. You know, if you really don't know how to or where to start with the questions, it's just, let me be honest, all the cultures that David listed out, the Asian culture, the Pacific culture, the Latino culture, you sit them down and say, hey, let's go out for a meal, buy them a meal. You get way further than saying, hey, let's have a meeting and, um, really talk through all the checklists. Like before you guys logged on, the three of us were talking about food, okay? <laughs> the, the Taiwanese, Filipino, and David's Caucasian, but inside he's like, like he said, it, it's a mixed melting pot. Being in, from a Latino culture and loving Asia, we're talking about food, okay? And then that's what really touches people's hearts. And that's when you really value what they value. In our culture, we say, if you want to work with someone, you have to eat with them. Mm, but again, true. it's valuing what they're, I'm not saying you have to do it with everybody. And maybe, especially in European cultures, they don't want to spend the time. They're like, hey, they value the task and you value what they value. And then when we go and we're like, okay, instead of, no, I don't expect you to spend like the first 20 minutes of the meeting to ask about my family, but especially in Hawaii, that's what you have to do. When, even if you go into the DM, um, DMV to try to renew your license, you talk to the lady about her son, about her husband, about the life on the island, and then that will get you way further than saying, I'm here to renew my license, what do I have to do? 
So do you care about the things they care about? That's how you celebrate. So that's oh. a little pitch for you guys. Cool. So from a practical standpoint, here's a couple of pointers I can give. Us. It, first of all, look at the calendar of the year. And you can go on Google, and you can look up um, culturally diverse holidays celebrated in America. And uh, there will be a humongous list of various holidays, some of which you may have never heard of. And then look and see who celebrates those holidays, OK, number one. Number two, as you see who celebrates those holidays, um, and you can see what cultures they are, look and see if those cultures are represented within your, your demographic or your geographic area of reach. Um, if they are, step three, I would say, is make a phone call or approach them, um, see if you can set up a meeting with someone who is an authority in, on, on that culture, um, and see what would be a relevant way of presenting that holiday on your marketing, in your marketing strategy, hear them out, make it, and I would actually say take it a step further, show it to them before you even do it, so work ahead a little bit, maybe you need to work, you know, four, six weeks ahead of the holiday, and then make it, see what they have to say. If they give the green, you know, a green light and thumbs up, schedule it in and, and push it out during that holiday season. You know, so this is really, you know, I think a step-by-step -step process I would recommend. And it just goes back to that. Uh, if we're really gonna honor and be really culturally aware, we need to take the time. And it's not just going to be something we can just, oh, I'm just gonna put out, you know, uh, happy Hanukkah or I'm gonna put out you know, Bodhi Day uh, advertising. Uh, it doesn't go ask the right authorities within your community, but it takes planning. Um, I had, and uh, just so you guys know, um, doing marketing properly, it does take a lot of foresight and planning. I think one of the things I've been running into a lot with a lot of the businesses is that they're trying to run their social media or their email campaign or whatever other marketing avenue, and they're kind of busy with the day-to-day -day of their running their business, but they, they're not able to think ahead about what needs to be done. So they're kind of like scurrying last minute, which is where we get the most mistakes. So if you can think ahead and plan well out, you can schedule out your, your content. There's amazing platforms like Sprout Social or Later, where you can have your, your social media content scheduled in advance and put out when you need it to. And you don't have to think about it. You don't have to worry about it. Um, and so basically, um, planning is very, very key, especially since there literally are holidays year round, especially as you look more at the diverse, cause we, we may think more in terms of like Christmas, Halloween, Thanksgiving, um, you know, Valentine's day, St. Patrick's day, but there are so many other, other holidays that are happening that are relevant to the communities around us. If we find out what they are and we need, and then ask the right people for advice, we can nail it. We can totally nail it. So let's just um, do that. I, I do want to reiterate if there are any questions because um, I, yes. I, David. I would love to hear from people or Sierra, if you have anything you want to add or a question you'd like to put in. If I didn't say mention anything that you think we should include, um, just feel free. So. Okay, David, there's a question from Cassie. I'm just going to read it out. It's in the Q&A. Any advice on connecting with other audiences during COVID? If we can't gather for a meal or coffee to get to know the other part of our community, other parts of our community, what is a good way to connect or reach out? What do you think? It's a great question. And I'm not seeing where this is on the thing. So I'm glad you saw that. <laughs> um, excellent question. It's on the bottom. It's on oh. the bottom when you see all the chats, there's a section in the QA on the very right. Oh, perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so um, yes. Well, here's a prime example of what we're doing right now on Zoom. I think no one ever dreamed that they'd be spending nearly as much time on Zoom as we all have been. It's crazy. I wish I had bought stock in Zoom a long time ago. And um, But literally, um, I found that when I've been able to connect pretty closely with a lot of people, like Sierra and I have not met in person yet, but we're already talking about meeting up to get some of her mom's adobo, uh, Filipino adobo. So, um, and that's just from, two brief Zoom in engagements that we've had. And so, and a couple emails. So I would say um, if, you, if you don't know someone um, personally and you're needing to connect, um, most often 
someone knows that person that you know, you can maybe approach them, have them be the third party to introduce you, set up a Zoom meeting with them, get to know them, have this face-to-face -face time here. That's my the best advice I can give at this point until the uh, COVID season hope is over, uh, whenever that will be. <laughs> um, but this is a, a really personal way. Um, yeah, I think I would add something similar or highlight the same thing, especially in these minority communities. Um, again, they're very relational. So if you really think Latino culture or Asian culture or Pacific culture, they're very relational. So have the key person to connect you to the community is very, very important. So, um, so Cassie, I think my direct answer to your question is um, from the people you know, ask them first, start there. Don't go, I think there's advice, lay it out in steps. I think the first step is to reach out to the, eventually whoever the target audience is, but if you have any friends from that culture or from that community, start there. And then from there, have them network you and introduce you out to the next um, tier of more like a client-based people that you might wanna connect with. So that will allow the community to have trust in you because someone is bringing you into the community. And then at the same time, you will have more understanding of who they are before approaching them. So I think that will be very helpful. And I actually being in Des Moines a couple of weeks ago, I think a lot of the restaurants or coffee places are still open. You can even say, hey, can we you want to grab coffee and just go to a park or next to the river or you know walk around East Village because that's still possible. So it, again, you're Reaching out, your first goal, if going from a task perspective, your first goal is to build a relationship and build understanding. So that actually doesn't, it's actually better to happen in a non-formal setting than a formal setting. So I think that will be another advice for you. It's like, yeah, grab a coffee and then let's just meet outside, sit next to the river. And then that, that way you're COVID um, sensitive, and then wear a mask if you have to, of course, and have all the things there, but you still can um, meet in person. And I think that's still super important because the face-to-face -face interaction always helps. Um, but yeah, start from the people that's around you from that community and then go in there. I think that'll be more, way more effective than just kind of, well, I see there's a group that I'm interested in, but I don't have a way in. Um, especially in these relational communities, it, will, it won't be as easy compared to the places you already have a connection point to. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead, hey, you guys, yeah. what would be, so let's say you've um, identified someone or a friend that's like, okay, I'm going to approach this community. How would you ask those questions? What is the most respectful way? Yeah, so I, I always preface whenever I ask questions that I basically say, I'm asking questions, but I want to know that you would know that I don't even know that I'm asking the right questions. <laughs> so I always kind of give that disclaimer. Um, so I'd rather than have, um, there's different types of questions. There's questions where you already make an assumption and you ask the question based on that assumption. And then there are questions that are truly like a question. So rather than say a question like, um, uh, you know, so, in, in Diwali, I see you guys do this, that, that, and the other. Explain uh, explain why that is. Maybe you take it a step further and say, why do you celebrate Diwali? <laughs> and why do you get, go more to the root of the, of the why? And, and then just be very humble in that process. You know, it's not, um, I, I've met with um, Buddhist, Muslims, uh, many, many different, um, uh, minority religious groups and ethnic groups, both locally here in Iowa, but also internationally, um, where I've had to, and over mealtime um, in Egypt with, with um, Muslim friends, asking some very, very sensitive questions. And um, the whole, my, my whole posture was one of humility and learning. Um, and so it, they can tell that if, if your posture internally and within you is that, 
and then you can you can learn quite a bit. And they're also um, more open to hearing from you as well about your ideas if you have that posture. So, um, yeah, I think one more thing to add to that: um, ask their stories. Like, what's the story behind this holiday? Mm -hmm. Like, if you ask a Chinese person why Chinese New Year's is being celebrated, they have their like ancient myth stories, but it's still their story. So, when you hear those stories and the history behind it, um, you will, from those places, have a better understanding of the values and the principles of what, um, why these cultural celebrations exist. So I think start with the whys and the history, um, that'll be very helpful. And then like David said, you're not asking the why to challenge, you're asking the why to understand. Let me say that again, because I think that's very important. It's not, you're not asking the why. I think we all can not understand. Like when we see something, we're like, I don't get this, why um, I, but you're not asking it to defend your point of view. You're asking it to truly understand their principles and worldviews that leads to the outward expression. So that's something I really want to highlight is that make sure our hearts are open and our ears are open, you know, when we're in this time. And then um, I'm going to give a very practical tip on these questions. Don't interrupt. Mm -hmm. Don't interrupt. Because when you're allowing them to tell stories, Stories take time. Reasons take time. Um, you can save all your questions to the end and let them finish the whole thing. And before you're like, can you repeat that again? Or can you explain this? Or I didn't get that. Or and I understand that. Okay. So maybe even if you need to take notes on your questions, let your friend know. It's like, hey, I'm only writing this so I can, it helps me process and it helps me take note of the things I have. I, I would love to ask more specifics on later, you know, so they don't feel like you're in, interrupted. Um, they're very relational, especially in these cultures. I think I've been emphasizing on that. So how do you handle your phone is very important too. Um, so I'm, I'm just being very practical here mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. interacting level. So I think those are some tips to really think about think stories. Um, don't ask that many questions when they are sharing, but kind of save it to the end and then be really intentional how to not be interrupted in the, in the whole process. Mm. I see a question as well uh, from Jesse Smith. Um, she's saying at Lutheran Services in Iowa, the refugee center, we have social media that is uh, CSA, farmer's market, customer facing and donor facing and educational about our programs. How can we apply these marketing lessons in this context? Minority groups aren't necessarily the main target viewers, but we still want to be inclusive and spread awareness on our social media platforms. Um, I think what you're talking about is the global greens farmers market with which with the refugee immigrant services. And I was taking a look at that and I love some of the slogans you have there. Cool. Uh, shop local, eat global. Um, and I love that because that's number one, we're valuing the local market the local farmers with their local produce, but we're saying with these same ingredients, you can have a global experience. And I was looking at some of the visuals on this site and I, I'm just actually gonna share this screen. I think you guys have actually done a pretty good job on here. Um, so I'm just gonna share this. So as we look at this, um, their site, um, you know, we see uh, the dates that are coming up, but then we see this um, table here, which has, you know, uh, I think it's uh, African, uh, one of the African minority groups. Um, and then we see recipes on here for how to use bitter melon, daikon, African eggplant, uh, you know, mustard greens, roselle. Hey, that's awesome. Because first of all, if I go on that platform and I look to see, <laughs> you know, oh, it's very practical and useful. I learned something. If I want to learn how to make a, a, a recipe with bitter melon, which first of all, what is bitter melon? A lot of people don't know. They talk about that. Um, it's uh, that it basically, and then they give the recipe and how to make it. That's extremely inclusive. Um, and even showing the photos of people on, on location who have that stand. Now, someone from a minority group 
uh, whether they be from an African minority group or Asian group, if they see that others within their community are being are participating in that farmer's market, and that there's actually um, they're actually showcasing ingredients and recipes from their culture, that's a all around win win for people who are not from that culture, and also people who are from that culture because everybody's being valued. So I think you guys have done a great job. So. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's more just me acknowledging the fact that you guys are doing a good job. <laughs> so I think um, from the question perspective, I would honestly ask, why would you like to put the, those kind of contents onto your social media or on your digital platforms? And from my understanding, it's like you said, you're, you wanna be inclusive, you wanna spread awareness. So if that is the case, then just highlight the things you value from those places. Okay, so one experience I can, I'm like, I'm a foodie, okay? So like, imagine if you have a bitter melon recipe and you have someone try it and say their experiences about it. Like, what did they, what surprised them? What was so special? Or, so you have the Asian cuisine, you have the African cuisine. And then you're, because like you said, the purpose of, you guys putting these things out there, of course, is to bless the local ingredient, uh, the local farmers, but to actually spread that kind of understanding. So how about you talk about positive experiences from the things that you have done? Because that will, again, upgrade the awareness level. Because if it's just like, hey, you should do this, everybody gets a lot of, of that kind of information. But if you share the next thing, which is, hey, I'm asking you to do this because I actually tried it and I was very impressed, surprised. It was very interesting um, and all these different, share your personal experience into it. It will help the people embrace the things that you're hoping that they will embrace. So I think that would be an, the, another thing I would recommend from the place of these are the things you can do to then next share, oh, these are the things that we actually did from personal experiences to forward the value that you wanna communicate. All right, thank you, Philip. So Sierra, I'm gonna let you close this time. We really appreciate the opportunity. And if you guys wanna reach out to us um, and email, uh, Sierra has my contact information or Philip's, you're more than welcome to reach out to us if you have further questions, uh, we'd love to be a resource. David and Philip, thank you so much for spending your time with us. This content was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, thank you. I look forward to meeting you one day. Um, and thank you so much again. Have a wonderful week. Absolutely, thank you. Nice, bye.